Hello, everyone, and welcome to a very special edition of the Chilling with the Villain podcast. Happy New Year's. Yes, it is New Year's Day, and it is a new day for the Chilling with the Villain podcast. I do apologize in advance. I feel a little bit under the weather. This week in between Christmas and New Year's is always just kind of like, I don't know. I just feel lazy. I just want to eat, you know, leftover Christmas food, want to eat all the chocolate that I received. And I just feel really kind of bleh. But I had to get out of my bleh to come <laughs> record this podcast today. So I hope you're starting your new year not feeling so bleh and feeling refreshed and excited to listen to Chilling with the Villain because today the reason why it is so special is because we have an interview, an exclusive interview with former WCW, WWE, let me get this right, New Japan, AAA and CMLL star Mark Jindrag. Now this is an interview I've been trying to get for quite a while now. I met Mark Jindrag a while back in Mexico. He has a really cool story and the interview that we did with Mark Jean Drag is very different to the typical wrestler's interview. So I think you'll find a lot of enjoyment and intrigue during it. So, yeah, please continue to listen to hear that exclusive interview with Mark Jean Drag. But enough about me, enough about the show. Samuel, happy New Year's. Happy New Year's to you. Good sir. Good sir. You know how you're explaining... In between Christmas and New Year's, that feeling where it's like blur, you don't want to do anything. Yes. That how people feel during that small period of time. I kind of feel all year round. <laughs> so maybe I should do something about that. I'm I'm funny and I'm not I'm not trying to suggest that I'm, you know, the rock or Mark Wahlberg or whatever, but I'm not very good at just like doing nothing. Like, if I try to have one of those days where I'm like, I'm just going to lay on the couch and watch movies or wrestling all day, I'll get to about, you know, four or five o'clock and I'm like, I've, I've got to go do something. I can't just, yeah. I can't do it. I don't know. It's weird. I hate doing it. And people will say, you know, oh, just take a, you know, you've been working hard or you've been doing this. Just take a day to relax. But for me, for whatever reason, I don't really enjoy mm. relaxing, I guess, for long periods of time, at least. I don't know. How do you feel about that? My problem is I'm fine with doing that, relaxing, chilling out, doing something I want to do. My issue is that should be a like a reward, right? <laughs> and the way I use it, the reward just is so, how do I put this? I only have to do 15 minutes of work to feel like I've earned a day <laughs> of watching movies. You know, like I need to get it in... The other way around, maybe. Yeah, or the other way. Yeah, the other way around, which would make it in line. Yeah, that's the issue. Would you... I feel like you're? I feel I feel like you're too far the other way around. Like you'll do work for like a whole week, and then you'll feel bad playing Crash Team Racing for an hour and a half. You know? Yeah. Well, it's I feel not like even... somewhere we should meet in the middle. Yeah, I don't know if feeling bad is the right word. I just you feel like I... you could be doing something better. Like, mm, more yeah, you could be doing something more productive. It's more like guilt, I think. Yes, I feel like a yeah. guilt to myself. Like, oh, I've like, yeah. I've got to do something. Surely, yeah, it's interesting, huh? Maybe you just said about wanting to change that. Would you suggest that there might be a uh, a New oh, Year's resolution, resolution for you? Do you do New Year's resolutions or not? If I guess no, <laughs> no, no, just look at me. Yeah, <laughs> has it worked? <laughs> With New Year's resolutions, I feel like people feel like they have to have them. So they'll quickly try and figure something out that they either haven't thought about before or or maybe not thought about enough. Or maybe they've thought of something that's kind of like a, without being really like a pipe dream, maybe something not attainable in like half a year or a year. Whereas I've already identified mine and it's kind of easy steps. Mm. So I feel like it's easy steps but it will kind of improve my life quite a bit so i think that's an attainable resolution so probably yeah do you think yeah well i definitely i definitely agree with sort of writing down your goals and i think that when you plan your goals i think it's much easier to attain them i mean that's just a thing for life as a whole like you think about how short life is like shouldn't we really have a plan 
for life or if, if there's something that you you desire something that you want or a dream that you want to accomplish should you try and work out some type of plan to get there do you know what i mean whereas if you because if you don't have any type of plan like what are the chances of you reaching that goal Take, right yeah I mean, so I definitely think write, writing down goals is, is really good. And mm-hmm. I think most years I have done that and uh, maybe some years I've not. And yeah, I think I definitely notice uh, a difference. So New Year's resolutions, I guess it's the kind of same as writing your goals down. But I think so the time that I do spend on social media or actually even just interacting with fans that, you know, when I get recognized in public or whatever else, it's just, I probably get asked this question every day, like, you know, like, oh, are you going to WWE? Are you going to AEW? Whatever it might be. So I feel like my New Year's resolution for 2024 should be to sign a contract with a major company or at least be on TV for a major company. And it seems like the fans absolutely want it. I'm sure there's some that don't, but it seems like a lot of fans want it because I get asked that and told that every single day. So I feel like I need to make it my new year's resolution to suggest, okay, 2024, the villain Marty scale will sign with a major company. So I guess I'm putting it out there now. And I feel like 2024 is the year for it. I really do. I feel like the people have waited enough and it's yeah. time. It's time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I need to just push the sound effect button from like Pavlov's dog. As soon as you say it's time, I'm ready to hit the top fives. Oh dear, dear, don't do that yet. But, um, and how was your Christmas, Sam? Yeah, not too bad. You know, I love it. Uh, I've changed my camera angle. I'm in a different room. So in the background, I've seen for the last, this episode, the episode before you see a Christmas tree. That's mm-hmm. just coincidental. This, this is actually up all year round, as you know, when you be That's- around. Yeah, I know it bothers you, but it does. I, I love Christmas. I'm into so, my interior know. design, and then you've just got nothing and a Christmas tree up. I live like, do you remember the original The Sims when you weren't using the <laughs> cheats for the money and you really did try it? You just have a, you just have a completely empty house. You've got the sofa, a table. I've got a weight machine, like the the workout bench. I mean, and and weights just by my sofa and a Christmas tree and a TV. I would That's say you, how li- I live. you live more like a, a student in a dorm, but I think even they put more effort in. They at least put a poster up or something. <laughs> yeah, true. And you you own this house. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Christmas was special because obviously we put out the Iron Claw review. Yes. Um, what was interesting is, so we were one of the first people to review the Iron Claw. And if you haven't listened to it yet, please go back and listen. And we kind of, we were like thumbs in the middle about the whole movie. You know, there were some really good things about it. There were some things we didn't really like about it. And overall, we thought it was average, maybe a little bit better than average, but we definitely had, it didn't meet our super high expectations and maybe that's on us. Um, But then I started looking on social media and especially within the wrestling community. I'm not sure if you saw this as well, Sam, but the people in the wrestling community were really putting it over huge and everyone was seemed to say how, like how great they thought it was and how amazing it was. Then I almost started doubting our review. I was like, did we, did we miss something? Or then I was thinking, did we really like, make, was it a great movie? But just like our expectations were just way, way, way too high. Um, so I started to almost not worry, but I was just like, Hmm, that's in- it's, it just seemed very interesting. But then, well, actually, I spoke to you about it, and you sent me these reviews. I, mean, I can't remember the, the reviews are from. Oh, was, The Guardian, Roger The Guardian, Vanity yes. Fair. Yeah. yeah. And they seem to be very actually aligned with our review, I thought. They made a lot of the same points we did. Yeah, I feel like wrestling types and online types really gravitated towards the movie, but the more kind of like mainstream or like old-style publications or like mainstream views kind of more aligned with hours yet we this podcast we walk that line of online types and wrestling types so it's just but we had like the more kind of like mainstream opinion or shared a lot of the critiques that mainstream reviewers mm-hmm. also had so I, I feel like that's probably why you had that not doubt but that kind of oh i feel like i'm in a you know 
my our opinions are in like the wrong place but it's just it seems like a lot of people shared our opinions but also at the same time a lot of people didn't it's been really interesting actually and i'm glad oh we put a community post out on a poll out on oh, how did I do? youtube people yeah it did it did pretty well in regards to engagement but more importantly it seems like people really did again wrestling types online types really did enjoy the movie like overall like we there's, had the option of two thumbs up one thumb up and then a thumb down and it was mostly two thumbs up quite wow. a few one thumb up and then only a handful of thumbs down so i'm glad as well you know we want the movie to do well and succeed i just feel yeah. like it what mm, well it, I, I i felt like it was going to be for me and it in reality it wasn't but it doesn't mean we don't want this film to like kick ass no, i, I really saw well. some people suggesting like that they thought Zac Efron would get an Oscar for it. I no, thinking, I was thinking. I mean, maybe actors have got Oscars for less, but it didn't. To me, it didn't scream Oscar-winning performance. Did it, you? No, it didn't. And I also he I'm wasn't even sure the star the, of the show for me. But go on, sorry. No, it's well. The um, the dad could win like best supporting actor. You know, that's yes. a category. That's a category. Mm -hmm. I actually don't think it's eligible for Oscars, right? Aren't there kind of like diversity requirements to have things considered now? How would you mean Oscars? Like you need like a certain percentage of non-white actors and production crew and stuff. Oh, really? Be eligible for yeah, yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. So it's probably not even eligible. Yeah. Really? Huh. I did see on social media, I think Instagram, maybe X mm -hmm. slash Twitter as well, the Blue Meanie put a post out. And now I really like Blue Meanie. When, well, actually, I, I booked Blue Meanie before for Ring of Honor. And it was really cool. But uh, he put a post out saying that he felt like the feedback was sort of the majority of people thought it was awesome, but that like the smarky smart fans were kind of like the small percentage of them we're like, oh, like we didn't like it because it wasn't, you know, because for example, like Ric Flair had the WCW title when he should have had the end of way title. And it just like historically, obviously it, it didn't align. Um, and I kind of thought, well, I didn't think the movie was amazing, but it wasn't because like, I understood that. Like I understood it wasn't going to be completely the same as the actual Von Eric story. I knew that going in. That's every movie. Do you know what I mean? But that's not yeah, why. Yeah. That's not why I didn't think it was amazing. Do you know what I mean? I love the Blue Meanie, man. And I'd love to get him on the F Oh, we on, should, on the yeah. Pod one time. But I, yeah, I didn't really like that take. I didn't agree with that take because I actually felt like he was doing what he was complaining other people are doing, but the other way around, like for the movie in that yeah. take. Does that make right. sense? I think so. I was like, yeah. yeah. But I mean, the fact that everyone has an opinion on it is awesome. Like, yeah. When we're talking about a wrestling movie, and like everyone has an opinion in it. And my non wrestling fan, like friends, sorry, mm -hmm. like they, they're all talking about it too. Well, it's uh, it's funny because now there's all this talk of A24 doing like other, you know, wrestling movies and picking up someone else's um, story. And I guess that begs the question, Sam, should A24 oh, yeah. pick do another wrestling movie or wrestling related movie? What would you like them to do it about? That's a good question. There it's was too I hard saw... to answer. It's too hard to answer because, on paper, like if you asked me, however many months ago, if you wanted A twenty four to do a Von Eric movie, I'd say hell yes. In fact, we did because we saw the trailer. We reacted to the trailer with it was a hell yes. But then in reality, we had issues where it was like, at, by virtue of it being an A twenty four two hour movie, mm -hmm. we actually didn't like it for kind of that reason it may have would have been a better series but that's not to say not every wrestling movie i mean every wrestling story wouldn't serve a good two-hour movie i think there's a lot so it's like how do you but we've got to pick hmm someone it's difficult someone sent me a tweet where someone was saying they should do a biopic of uh chris benoit and do it with tom hardy okay which I thought was relatively interesting. But to be honest with you, I don't think that would be my first choice. Like, I think we've had this conversation on the podcast before where a biopic for wrestlers is just like a really exciting kind of idea because we've seen it with mainly with, with art, music artists and musicians. Yeah. You know, we've seen like the 
the Queen one and Elton John, Elvis, and a lot of them I've really enjoyed. I really have. So, but you know, think about them even doing a Hogan one or a Flair one, a Bret Hart one. There's just so many wrestlers that you think, you know, Bruiser Brody, like so Terry Funk, there's so many of them. Like, I just love that idea. Maybe we should get into the movie industry, Sam. But just make them ourselves. Yeah, I reckon. <laughs> no, that's not a bad idea. Well, if we did want to make a wrestling movie, then we would definitely have to get actors and get them into great shape, right? We mm -hmm. saw Zac Efron. The shape that he got in for the Iron Claw was pretty unreal. But when you're trying to get in shape like this, you don't want to get help from the black market. That's just not a smart idea. What you can do, though, to help you get into amazing shape is go to our sponsors, LegacySups.com, and get yourself the Test X9 Natural Test Booster. Natural being the key word. Yes, the Test X9 Natural Testosterone Booster is a professionally developed nine-ingredient formula for testosterone enhancement. Think of Test X9 as the all-star team of clinically proven test booster ingredients. We all know how important testosterone is and how, as we're getting older, our natural testosterone is declining. So you really need help. And Test X9 is the exact thing for you. It's going to increase your strength. It's going to increase your energy. I've just been saying how kind of tired and blah I've been feeling this week. I think I need some Test X9 myself. And also, it's going to increase your sex drive, your libido. And that can only be a good thing. Not only that, but it's going to improve your sleep and just your general well-being. So you can't afford to miss out on the Test X9 Natural Test Booster. And do you know what? Just for listening to the show, you can save yourself 10% of your order. Yes, just for listening to the Chillin' with the Villain podcast. Use the promo code Villain, that's V I W -L, L A I N, for 10% off now at legacysups.com. And who knows? Maybe you could end up looking like Zach Efron in the Iron Claw. <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to think, would I like to look like that? Yes. <laughs> would, you like, would you like to maintain it? Oh, boy. Well, it, I did see some interviews on Zach Efron just about you saying how intense. Mm. you know the diet and the training was to get in that shape and it does make you giggle we see this a lot when people just say oh steroids steroids it's like i'm positive he was on a lot of stuff and probably growth right. hormone and everything else but it's like i've also seen so many dudes in the gym taking all sorts of stuff and they don't look nothing like that do you know what i mean so just, I, had a, I had a friend who said that she goes oh it's just i just see steroids it's like yeah, and hard work. Right. Like the steroids part is the obvious. You don't need to mention that. That's just, you know what I mean? But it's like, right. yeah, I don't believe that those steroids would make you look like that. That is a no. lot of dedication and a hard work. So amount. I guess yeah, when you're getting sure. paid millions of dollars, it's a bit easier to stay motivated to look like that, I guess. Yeah. Oh, I, I thought of a movie, by the way, that A24 should do. Remember, remember uh, Santino's story, going to Japan, leaving his daughter at home, that sort of thing. Yeah. I before, that'd be a good, that would be a good movie story, I think. Yeah, it would be. I mean, honestly, any real professional wrestler that's made it is, is probably got probably a very interesting has a, story. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? Like, talking about wrestlers and movies, mm -hmm. and obviously our episode last week, The Iron Claw, yeah. it got me thinking, there's been a bunch of wrestlers that have tried to move into Hollywood and a lot of wrestlers that fancy themselves as actors. So it got me thinking, maybe a good theme for this week's top five would be the top five wrestler performances in movies. So Sam, you know what time it is. It's time. It's time for Marty and Sam's top five. Oh, baby. I'm going to go first because I think you're, right. you're more of a movie guy than I am. So coming in at number five, Randy Savage as Bonesaw in Spider-Man. <laughs> now, that might seem like an odd choice. There's a really funny meme that I've seen. I'd have to, I wonder if I can find it, where it's basically like 
Randy Savage wrestled for 25 years and won multiple world championships to prepare for his role as Bonesaw in Spider Man. <laughs> 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 which I thought was really funny. But the reason why I love um, Randy Savage's bone saw so much in Spider-Man was just because to me, the way he looked, the way he was dressed, his gimmick, the way he looked and his name bone saw, it was like the sort of like ultimate sort of idea i think of what like a casual person thinks of as like an american yeah. wrestler do you know what yeah. i mean does that make yeah. sense he like played totally. that like he played that role just so perfectly like anyone would see him and be like oh yeah it's a wrestler do you know what i mean um i just thought that was so good and, like he looked tremendous so good mm. in spider-man and what year did that come out 2002 was it i think so bone saw spider-man i'm just putting up a picture of him again now but I want to say maybe 2000, yeah, 2002. But I'm looking at these pictures. I'm like, dude, he looks incredible. You just think, man, why couldn't they sort things out with the WWE and, you know, have him come in in 2002 when he looked like this or 2001 or wherever it was. You're just like, oh, it would have been amazing. It's such a shame that we never got that. And you know what? I'm looking at the pictures now and I'm thinking, hmm, why have I never thought of doing a bone saw? costume for halloween for halloween yeah good. <laughs> there we go i'm not sure if anyone knows who it is but uh yeah so yeah my number five randy savage as bone saw and of course randy could probably only really play a professional wrestler and here he is my number four is also a wrestler playing a wrestler but this is less because of how well he did and more just like how important i guess it kind of was on the business my number four is hulk hogan as Thunderlips in Rocky Three, I believe it yeah, was. Yeah, three. Um, and the reason for this, obviously, Hogan, he really dabbled in Hollywood and tried to get his acting career going. And it, all the Hogan movies, they're pretty bad, right? Yeah, just, come on. They're just cheap and just, yeah, not good. I just think with Hogan, he's such a well known character as himself, and he's already a character. I just think it's like impossible for him to play anything else other than Hulk Hogan himself. Do you know what right. I mean? Yeah. Arnold Schwarzenegger is kind of in the same boat, but it works for him. There was just something missing with Hulk Hogan. I, I, I find I don't really know what. Yeah, I'm going to actually bring this point up in my next one or actually in my number two, but yeah. Uh, but Hogan playing Thunderlips in Rocky three, this kind of like was the start of Hogan getting his massive break which led into him going to the WWF and Hulkamania and basically, you know, started everything that we have now. So I think like this specific role in the movie is like key to wrestling history. And that's why I felt like I had to put it on the list. And it's an iconic scene as well. Definitely. My number three is Kevin Nash as Tarzan in Magic Mike Double XL. Have you seen this before? He's my honorable mention. Okay, great. Yeah. So I think the reason why this is high up on the list, it's like we just talked about how other wrestlers have gone and basically just played wrestlers. He's gone and played a stripper, which I assume is just like nothing like the real person, Kevin Nash. That's quite, you know, a big jump from, you know, plus it also not only is he a wrestler, but he's, a seven foot. He's massive. Dude. Yes. Right. And for him to be like, I could play a stripper. I think mm -hmm. is just really, really funny. You know, I was watching uh, the scene again the other day um, when he comes out on stage, he's performing, he's doing like a strip tease or whatever it is. And he's like, got like an, uh, a painter theme or an artist. And um, he gives it like the, the suckets, the crotch chops during mm -hmm. his dance. And I did wonder if that was in the script or if that was him improvising do you know what I, mean? I thought it was kind of an interesting uh little bit there but um no kevin nash is just the coolest like the coolest looking dude and i think him being able to pull off a role like this just kind of speaks a lot for kevin nash and he's been and also that the actual is it weird that i think the magic mike movie is awesome as well i really enjoy it yeah do you prefer the first or the second i i can't i can't really differentiate the two right now i think this oh, okay. Oh, what I really enjoyed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I enjoyed the movie as well. And that that is a really, really high profile 
movie for Kevin. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. And Nash has been in a lot of other stuff. What else has Nash been in again? Uh he's been a lot. I've seen him quite a lot of times. The Punisher. Mm-hmm. He was the Russian. Oh, he was Shredder in um, Turtles as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's done. He's done a lot, and more so, I think, like the last ten years or so. So, yeah, I I do wonder just how it's interesting, like the whole world of Hollywood, and just sort of how hard it is to break into. It's funny mm-hmm. when you go to Los Angeles and everyone you meet, whether it's your waitress or Uber driver. They're all there trying to audition for parts and movies. It's like everyone's on the hustle and it's just so hard for anyone to break into Hollywood. That's why when a wrestler does break Hollywood, it's like, you know, it's like, wow, extra special. Sure. My number two, someone that I think arguably has sort of broke Hollywood the best out of all the wrestlers. I'm going for Dave Batista as Drax in Guardians of the Galaxy. Now... You just said about Arnold Schwarzenegger kind of playing the same role pretty much throughout his whole career, which I, yeah, I, I tend to agree with, but I think there's much better examples. I know when we were at the movie theater to watch an iron claw, there was that trailer for, I don't know. It was like a Jason <laughs> Statham movie. Like the beekeeper or whatever it was called. I'm yeah. not, I can't remember what it was, but we, I, I think I literally said to you, I was like, it's insane how, Jason Statham has literally played the same character for 20 years. And not also, only played the same character, but looks the same. Yeah, he still looks like, great. Doesn't even, yeah. yeah, no, but I mean, he doesn't like dye his hair or grow it out or even wear a wig or right. he's yeah. literally Jason Statham. <laughs> he, he is, he is. <laughs> and um, and we'll and, watch it. Right. And well, yeah, but like also The Rock as well. I feel like yeah. he plays the exact same character in every movie. There's not like a whole lot of depth there. But with Batista, I feel like he really had to come out of his comfort zone for this movie. And I feel like he's played different characters in different movies. And obviously yeah. Guardians of the Galaxy, massive, massive movie. He was like one of the highlights of Guardians of the Galaxy for me. He brought that kind of comedic element. And it was, you know, I thought really cool to see that out of someone that's such a, an intimidating looking wrestler. And you know what's yeah. funny? Apparently Dave Batista said that before Guardians of the Galaxy, he was broke and this kind of got him back into it. And I was like, how did he get so broke after yeah. his massive wrestling run? I don't know if he had divorces or what, but maybe he's just, not, I don't think he's very good at looking after his money apparently, or at least wasn't, I guess but I guess Guardian saved his ass. I think I heard that. I hope that I haven't Made misremembered this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So edit this out if that's not the case, <laughs> uh, but yeah, go on. Sorry about his like he seems to have quite good range as an actor actually mm-hmm. when i was asking friends like oh we're doing um wrestler performances in movies that a couple of people asked if i've seen batista in knock cat the cabin have i've heard that? that's really good i've not yeah seen uh okay no neither have i apparently he's really good in that and it's more like a subdued softer role yes uh, yeah maybe we should check it out in, yeah, in fact, um, I keep meaning to watch this movie because I've seen. Yeah, it does look. It looks interesting, and I think he plays quite an, an you know, an intense character. So if that would be. We should. We should definitely watch that. We should, yeah, yeah. And coming in at number one, of course, it's Rowdy Roddy Piper as Nada in They Live, yeah. <laughs> and I don't. <sighs> It's obviously a personal bias for me just because I love Roddy Piper, but I did actually think he was, he was great in this and he's kind of playing himself, but himself mm. is like a action hero movie star. Do you know what I mean? So high energy, like charisma off the charts. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So what was funny about when I did a little research for they live that kind of famous fight scene between Nada, Roddy Piper and, Frank, I think his name is, when they're kind of outside the dumpsters and stuff. Yep, yeah. Apparently, this, in the script, it was only supposed to be a 20-second fight <laughs> scene, but apparently Piper and the other dude, for whatever reason, they just decided for like three weeks, I guess, when they weren't when they were on set and not filming, <laughs> they were practicing this fight scene and kept coming up with more and more stuff to the point where they showed the director it or whoever, and um, he was like, oh, I love it. Let's keep it in. It ended up being like a five-minute fight scene. And like every time you're watching it, when you think it's finished, 
like, it keeps it's, going on and on. Like, yeah. Not amazing. in a bad, not in a bad sense. Like it's just like it takes you by surprise. Like, oh, it's still going. Like, um, so yeah, and I just it I think Piper did a, a handful of movies because I know was maybe it was like 91, 92, or maybe it was early. Well, obviously they live was 1988. Um, but there was definitely points in the WWF where he was like, yeah, I'm leaving to go to Hollywood. And I, I think he probably thought he was going to be a big star in Hollywood. And why not? I mean, you know, I feel like if you back then, if you're such a big star in wrestling, you kind of assume that you could be a big star in that. And uh, like I said, Hollywood seems like a really, really, really hard thing to break. I have a, so much respect for these Hollywood actors and everything yeah. else. But yeah, I just, uh, I haven't seen this day live for years and years and years, but I feel like I need to go watch it back because it was a fun movie as well. It's so good. It's yeah. fun. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> I love it. All right. Awesome, man. That's pretty good. It's pretty good. It's my turn. All right. Number five, I've got the big show in the water boy is Captain <laughs> Insano. Do you remember? Captain, yes, of course. Yeah. yeah. So this isn't the best movie in the world or the best portrayal in the world, or I mean, best acting performance in the world. But when exactly like what you said about Randy Savage in Spider-Man, like what does a general audience think a wrestler is? Back in those days, of course you cast the big show, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Perfect casting for that sort of character. We need a big, the, the name Captain Insano, just kind of generic, over the top. The performance, the the star, you know, he's over seven feet tall. It's just like the perfect. We want to get our point across, like a very unsubtle point, as quickly as possible. We cast the big show. He did a really good job. So he's number five. I mean, people remember that as well. Like he, I think every now and then, big show, like he's busted it out on AEW a couple of times. So people remember the gimmick, you know? Oh, okay. That's cool. That's cool. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Number four, I've got Roddy Piper and They Live. The movie is, I'm biased because I love Roddy Piper and I love They Live and I love John Carpenter movies. I've got three 80s, awesome 80s movies, 80s wrestlers, cool portrayal. Like I, my list is kind of gravitating towards that kind of style. That's number, that's the first one. Yeah, because Maybe movies now the suck. <laughs> yeah, they now suck. So yeah. Uh, but Roddy Piper and They Live, you said everything I wanted to say. He's just so charismatic. He's like a real life movie star. Anyways, of course, put him in something like that. He, it's not like he carries them, like we necessarily need him. The movie's good enough on its own, but just having Roddy Piper in it is just the icing on the cake. It's amazing. I really, I love it. We should watch that. Uh, it's been a while since I've seen it too. Number three, I've got Randy Savage in Spider Man as Bone Son of Grog <laughs> because. It's the same thing that we said with the big show in, in The Waterboy. He's just the perfect person to cast for this is what a over the top, insane American wrestler is. And he just did such an amazing job. And it's so iconic. Like it's endlessly memeable. That's my favorite Spider Man movie, by the way, I think. The first one. I prefer the second one. Well, I mean, that, that series of them, though. Oh, that's it. Yes, me too. With yeah. Toby Maguire. Uh, yes, yeah, me too, for sure. The third one, yeah. But yeah, the first third one was weird, huh? Awesome. Yeah. 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 No, no, number two was my favorite one, but I meant the stats. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Me too. Yeah. So Toby, uh, Toby Maguire, Peter Park is trying to like, isn't he trying to impress Kirsten Dunst? But and he's like, so he needs money in his wheels. He's trying to buy a car. So he just like sees this wrestling show <laughs> yeah. as like a means to like, oh well, I've got these powers now, right? So this is going to go easy. Yeah. And then he's up against Bone Saw McGraw, and they just have these constant back and forth that are just amazing. It's funny. I think like that portrayal of wrestling, I think that's what a lot of people are like, you know, maybe part of my family, but not like the, the closest, like think mm. that's what I do. Cause that's you know, what, they'll, yeah. they'll ask me questions like, Oh, so do you get paid more if you win and stuff like that? So I think they think I'm doing that basically what Spider-Man does with bone saw. <laughs> I wish wrestling was like what people, I wish it was like how they portray it in Spider-Man. Right. Yeah, right. for sure. Number two, I've got surprised he's not on your list. Jesse Ventura. Yeah, I did. Well, there's yeah. loads of guys we could. Uh, okay, yeah, you're right. It's just it's I tough feel like that's top five. Yeah, I feel like that's the best movie on my list. Was it mm -hmm. the best portrayal? Kind of, in a way, actually. Just big burly guy with mm -hmm. a mustache in the in the eighties. Like, what more do you need? <laughs> I mean, I, love, my I love Jesse Ventura. I love yeah. Jesse Ventura. I love Predator. When you're a kid, as well, it just like goes. I don't know. How many times did you watch Predator growing up? I can't remember now. An, an uncountable amount. Oh, only a handful? Oh, okay. 
So for me, because I watch it so much, like every kind of line of his I can like think of, I you know, and can quote. They're just in my in my brain. So he's just like he's up so high in this list because, you know, the movie's so good. I watch it so much, and it's just that's a nostalgia pick. Well, they all are. Let's be honest, but that's yeah. the main one for me personally. <laughs> but number one, as a portrayal, I've got you're like this. I've got Terry Funk in Roadhouse as Morgan, dude. Oh my god! So if you haven't seen Roadhouse, it's about a guy. He was a what was he like? A I can't remember his last job, but he's now he's a very like spiritual and soft spoken bouncer for like a biker bar, and he becomes like the head bouncer. And he the the previous bouncer is this guy called Morgan, played by Terry Funk, who's just he's always drinking at the bar. He's not taking it seriously. He's always kind of starting more fights that, that he could have uh, de-escalated. And he gets fired early on in the movie when Patrick Swayze's character like takes over. And then he becomes like a, not the main bad guy, but a henchman for the bad guy for the rest of the movie. But why he's number one is there's these bar fights and he just can't stop guerrilla press slamming people, <laughs> which is something I've never seen Terry Funk Wright really do. But he... He tables, because obviously it gets number one. If someone gets tabled, then I'm I'm happy. He gorilla press slams this guy through a table, but it's not like a wrestling table. It's one of those bar tables where the the um the base of it is in the middle and it's a circular table. And this guy just gets slammed straight on top of it, which just if you think about it in real life is gross. But he also gorilla press slams another guy in the background of a there's this bar fight, it's a long scene, and there's just chaos everywhere and if you look in the top right corner i think it's been a while since i've watched it you see uh terry funk again gorilla press slamming somebody <laughs> just throwing them on the ground and they just take it and then after he does that because there's danger all around he does that um you know where terry funk kind of he spins around in a spot in a circle like with yeah. his jukes up and if you didn't if you know who terry funk is you've never seen roadhouse you just came in on that scene you just saw like in the corner of your eye, like you know it's Terry Funk just by the, that kind of manner. Right, yeah, of course. I've also got to say, he looks massive in the movie, but that's because he's, how tall is he, by the way? Like six Terry foot, Funk's maybe? a pretty he's, big he's, guy. He's, he's, he's tall, but he's not like super tall. And he seems kind of small in wrestling. But when you put him against normal looking people, like in this movie, he's he's hench, like he's massive. Well, like, no, I, he is a big person. He looks smaller in, in wrestling because the area, yeah, everyone, yeah. everyone yeah, was true. massive compared to, yeah. like, you know, he's 6'1", you know, 6'1", builders, oh, 247, six one. Okay, cool. 247 pounds. Like, Jeez Louise, yeah. Yeah, so he's, he's a, a big, burly guy, yeah. yeah. But that movie is great. And if you just want to see Terry Funk throwing people around in a bar <laughs> and causing trouble, that's, yeah, it's definitely worth a watch. The movie's great, but... Just watch Terry Funk in it, man. He's so good. Absolutely. Well, I feel like it was a great top five. I mean, we could have said about um, we could have said about Andre the Giant, you know, and Princess. Oh, Princess Bride. Right. Yep. Uh, there's so much stuff we could have got, but obviously, you know, Even... we didn't. We didn't mention the most famous wrestler slash actor, The Rock. <laughs> no, John Cena. Yeah, John but, Cena. Yeah, these are our yeah. personal favorites. It, it does seem that it seems like in the last twenty years that movies have got worse but tv shows have got better it seems like now yes no i i kind of yeah with, yeah. with these tv series and stuff that come out on the streaming services there's been some amazing mm. amazing ones and it seems like now when someone genuinely wants to create something meaningful and tell an amazing story they decide to do it in tv series form Whereas they used to do it in a movie. And I feel like now with movies, it's more a case of, you know, who can we put as the lead actor where, you know, yeah. all the basic bitches will come watch and we'll make loads of money. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. No, I that's think how, right. That's how it seems like to me. But like TV has got better. But yeah, the movies have got worse, I feel. So that's just my opinion. I've got, pretend this was, I've got a killer honorable mention that I should have done. Mm -hmm. Right. My honorable mention for best wrestling performance in a mainstream movie is the concept of pro wrestling as the fight, as the in universe fighting style in Blade 2. <laughs> yeah. Have you, like, in that movie, when they, when they fight, it's not the standard, like, fighting, like, it's not like boxing or kickboxing. For some reason, in that movie, the in universe fighting style is professional wrestling. And oh. they're doing brain busters, they're doing elbow drops. It, but Triple H was in it, right? Triple H was in Blade Trinity, the third one. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
But the second one, for no, for inexplicably, they just, they're all doing pro wrestling. And not like um, how wrestling is now, like, you know, incorporated into MMA or something like that. No, this is literally pro wrestling. Like he's doing stalling brain busters and yeah. saying quotes. It's amazing. Well, it's a more visually exciting thing, you know, like every movie, not every movie, but millions of movies have had fight scenes where it's just punching kicks. It's like, so mm -hmm. wrestling is just more visually entertaining and spectacular, I guess. So that was a great shout for them. But um, yeah, that was our top five. Yeah, that was really fun, wasn't it? Yes, it was really fun. And you know what else is going to be really fun? Our exclusive interview mm -hmm. with the reflection of perfection. Former WCW tag champ, former WWE superstar. He wrestled in Japan. He left America and made a really massive name for himself in Mexico, much like what the villain is doing now. Today's <laughs> guest, Mark Jindrag. So I'm not going to waste any more time. Let's go on over to the interview with Mark Jindrag. So here we are joining us at this time on the Chilling with the Villain podcast. Yeah. He, he is a former WWE, WCW, AAA, CMLL, even New Japan Pro Wrestling superstar. He is, of course, my friend, Mark Jindrak. Hello, Mark. How are you doing? Thanks for coming good, on the show today. Good. No, thank you. I'm, I'm looking forward to Chilling with the Villain. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so we actually spoke about this a little bit when we had Chris Masters on the show. But okay, sexy lot, Jesus. Yeah, we had we had sexy Jesus on the show. Nice. Uh, I think the I was gonna say the last time I saw you, and I think also maybe the first time I met you, you saved my ass in Mexico. You saved my life. So I'm in forever in debt for you that I'm not still stuck no, in Mexico no, that now. Was, <laughs> I was that's that could happen to anyone. My Spanish <laughs> helped out a little bit, that's all. <laughs> are you um are you are you living in Knoxville still or you're I'm in, in Knoxville, Tennessee, yeah. Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, you know, I never thought I'd live in Tennessee at all, but uh, I took a job here. Like, in my, always while I was wrestling, my hobby was uh, like sports cards, um, collectibles, things of that sort, like baseball, basketball, football cards. And so, like, when I kind of got out of wrestling, um, I just kind of dove in. And there's a there's a company here that they, we actually grade and authenticate autographs and things of that sort. So. Uh, I moved here. It's kind of like a passion job. And, uh, you know, so it's pretty nice. Tennessee's a nice place. Nashville's close by. Knoxville, of course, is cool. It's the capital. Uh, our mayor is Kane, you know, so. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> you can't go wrong. Our mayor is Kane. That's hilarious. So. Yeah, I wanted, I, I think I heard, I think you, last time I saw you, you told me about the grading cards. So it's sort of like the big famous one is PSA, right? PSA is like probably the, the most used. There's Beckett. Um, we're probably like number four or number five in the in, gotcha. in grading, you know. So, but we're we're like a brand new company, so we're yeah. kind of a niche, you know. Our, what we can do is like, like PSA is very like a uh, plain label. It's it's more for buy and resale and stuff like that. The the old timers right. like the, the old heads like it, you know, and it's good resale. We're we're more like uh, we think outside the box. Our labels, we have custom labels, color labels, things of that sort. So, it's more for uh, you know a different. Uh, you know, like not really from my generation, but the the newer generation, they, right. you know, they don't care so much about the grade. They care about what the, the, the whole setup looks like. So that's kind of what we do. We put our touch on collectibles. So it, it it's, seems, it's a cool job. Yeah. I mean, I find it fascinating because it seems like, it seems like during the pandemic, nobody had anything to do. So everyone just started collecting stuff. Yeah. Like I've got many friends that run businesses and during them, I was like, oh, how's business? They're like, oh, it's going great because everyone's bored. They're just buying so much stuff. And yeah, I think yeah. they did that with, it definitely happened with, um, I don't know how familiar you are with like wrestling figures. I've got some like classic wrestling figures. Oh, and they, yeah. all, they all yeah. shot up. And funny enough, a lot of people now get those PSA graded or whatever it might be. But the sports cards and especially like people's rookies cards just started going crazy. Oh, right? yeah. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was an explosion. And like... Uh... You know, like, it was a point in time where, like, Target and Walmart, like, people, there's 20, 30, 40 people waiting for the uh, the stocker to st stock the, the shelves and things of that sort. So, right. it was it was tough. It was real tough. It was a lot of newbies in the, the, the hobby. And then all the old heads like me dug up all their cards in mom's attic and stuff. And, right. You know, and now, like, that... 
that whole bubble had burst. The market has gone down. It's, oh, really? It's, level, it's leveled out. You know, and then, you know, the left left are the diehards like myself. So right. I'm cool with it. I, I love it. Like, I'm here at my desk. I just, you know, got just cards upon cards. Like, I, I do it all day. I just love, I have a little eBay store. Um, Mark Jindrak cards, check me out on eBay. I got, you know. <laughs> oh, you, oh love, wow. I got over like twenty five hundred listings. I, I do it in my free time. Just damn, just, just different players, you know, from Michael Jordan to LeBron James to Tom Brady. You know, all the everybody. Um, That's so like we, me and Sam. We're both well, Sam especially, but we're both you know in the stock market. Would you consider it kind of like? It's similar to that, right? Really? So you guys are in the stock market. I didn't, that's that's awesome. I, mm. I I'm so intrigued by that. Like I have to pick your brain, uh, you know, off air and stuff. Sam's your guy. I I put money in and then lose it and hope it goes up someday. But Sam's your guy for that. Yeah. <laughs> but I just, just, I'm just intrigued about that. Yeah. But so. it seems like you're already kind of in it, just in a different form. Yeah, cars yeah. cars are kind of like that. You 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 kind of. My brother actually I have a brother. Uh, ironically, he's less than a year uh, younger than me, so he's we're eleven months apart. Uh, while I was out wrestling and stuff for the last 20 years, uh, he was an engineer, so he made some pretty good money. Uh, and he got into the buying heavy big cards, like big, big cards. So, like, right now, like in 2009 when there was that recession and stuff here, he went on eBay and he was buying cards on the low. Like, and mm. now he's got, like, probably about 20 cards in, this, in a vault. It's called a, a PWCC vault, and it's, like, in Oregon. And uh, 20 of his cards value over, like, $2.4 million or something. Jeez. Like, he's got, like, like there's a, a messy rookie, PSA 10 messy rookie. Uh, there's only wow. 21 10s in the world. And he has two of them, two out of the 10, of uh, 21. So so I think they go for about $275,000 each, you know, so. Dude, I that's just mind-blowing, yeah. isn't it? It's <laughs> funny. It's funny. So I'm a big um football fan or what you guys i guess would call soccer and um i watched live- that last though it's football football right. <laughs> life your football football mexico yeah um mm. but we, we live in florida and i remember there was rumors of messi you know coming to miami and i was looking at tickets and they were like 15 dollars. and then they finally i didn't buy any tickets then they finally announced messi is joining miami and now tickets are like 500 dollars. <laughs> so- yeah can you imagine you bought the whole Right. For, his, for his first game, he bought the whole section. I should have done. Jeez, absolutely. <laughs> but um, Sam, you have a yep. question that you were running by me. And I didn't actually know this, but Sam's got a question he's been dying to ask you. Oh, this is going to sound like a non sequitur, but I have to know. So I've just got to get it out. So there's a claim online that you have or had the highest vertical in WWE history. Now, yeah. I yeah. couldn't find any kind of real... What's the legitimacy to that with 43 inches? First of all, um, this is two-parter. Well, uh, I guess it was never formally, formally, like, I don't know where they got, like, I think somewhere in the the time I played basketball, something yeah. was recorded. Um, but I always used to, when I was in WWE, I used, I used my WWE TV time. Most guys are getting on the shows, they want to be champions and stuff. I used to love all the extras that came with being on TV, like, I would get myself in celebrity basketball games and stuff. And like, uh, I've really shut like, like, I don't know. Like I do three sixty dunks. Or I, or I used to like, you know, I'm 46 years old now. So you <laughs> no, know, yeah. 10, years, 10 years ago, like I was doing three sixty dunks with like, I, I could touch one time. And this is a true story. One time in the Staples center, um, me and Orton were walking around the back and, uh, if you ever saw the documentary, we we're we we're idiots together. You know, we we're always coming up with crazy shit. And uh, Shane McMahon came around the corner, and I was like, "Man, I bet you I could touch that thing on the ceiling." And and Shane McMahon's like, "No, you can't." Or was like, "No, you can't." I said, "I bet you I can." And at that time, like the whole like writing department, wrestlers started gathering around. Vince came around the corner, so it was like literally thirty people watching me. And I actually jumped up, and my second time, I I touched this metal thing on the ceiling at the Staples Center. <laughs> so everybody was in awe. So Shane McMahon went to get a tape measure, and he, he measured it, and it was 12 feet 2 inches. So, <laughs> Jeez. And, like, I, like I, could, I could touch my armpit in the basketball rim and stuff. So, I mean, I'm 6'6", six, six, but the 40, right around 40 inches is, is you know, um, probably legit at, at my peak, you know, so. Yeah.
So Montez Ford of the Street Profits says that he's got the highest vertical at, but he just says over 40. And I mean, he doesn't mean frog splash, right? So there's some, you know, I, I kind of believe it, but there's two kind of camps here. It's like, is it Mark or is it Montez Ford? And I was just, oh, but we can actually find this out definitively because what did you say Shane said the measurement was? Because we just subtract your height from it. 12 feet, 12 feet, 2 inches. Okay. 12 feet, 2 inches. And you're 6 foot 5. I'm 6, six, yeah, six five, six six. So here's a question. Sam mentioned Montez Ford. Do you, Mark, do you know who that is? Do you um, keep I've, up to date I've with wrestling? I've heard his name. No yeah. respect, disrespect him. I, I've sure. heard his name. Um, and you know, when, when guys do like athletic crazy stuff like um they usually put it in my timeline on on x or whatever because i've I've always been like a defender of my drop kick you know uh <laughs> for sure when i see stuff like you know i see these polls by wwe who had the greatest drop kick ever you know and they got like jumping jim brunzel and <laughs> kurt henning and no disrespect to them but like kurt henning had a cool drop kick because he was yeah. part of his character but the drop kick itself is like it's like three feet off the ground, you know, like, right. yeah. so, so, I'm, so I, I've heard the guy's name. Like I, I, I've, I've heard he's real athletic and stuff, you know, there's, yeah. there's a lot of athletic guys and I still watch product. I, I watch AEW here and there. Um, I watch WWE you, from time to time, but what do, what do you think of AEW? Have you got anyone there that you like or any opinion on the product at all? Um, it's kind of, it's kind of cool. Like, um, I like those guys out of uh, Mexico, like Penta, um mm. and see the guy who the guy who manages penta the guy on tv alex the hype man i think he's called yeah um i have a long history with him like we used to have this lucha libre usa deal and uh it was myself the owner and this guy alex he was actually like our head writer for lucha libre usa and it, oh i never knew we, that yeah so that's kind of like the long history and stuff so and actually uh penta i think he's on the card for I'm wrestling in February on, on with Robles Promotions in Mexico, and I think in Monterrey, uh, myself, Jurlistico, and um, Penta are going to be in a three-way match. So, oh, that's really cool. Well, I, yeah, I, was, I, I want you to ask me about. Sorry, yeah. go on. No, no, I was like talk about talk about throwing me in the fire. I haven't wrestled like <laughs> two times in five years, and I look on the card, and I'm in a three-way match with. Two, two arguably the best high flyers in the game today, you know. So <laughs> that's awesome. I wanted to ask you that because when I I saw you, I want to say about a year ago or so, and you were doing your first matches in I think it was four years, and since yeah. then I think you've only have you only wrestled once or twice since then, maybe or no, none, not since, at all. Since I, since I saw you, I have not wrestled again. So what's going on? Are you just getting the wrestling bug, or is it? You know, it's uh. I, I recently changed my um, supplementation like crazy. Like I, I'm I'm big into supplements and stuff, but I never thought about it from a deficiency standpoint, you know. Mm-hmm. So I heard this Joe Rogan um, podcast with Gary, a guy named Gary Brecca. He's like a human biologist. He's all over. He's probably your social media viral social media guy for like you know biology stuff and like. I just went, you know, I listened to that probably two or three times. Took notes. I changed all my like. You know, I learned about gene mutations and stuff like, and I started not only supplementing for things, but I started supplementing for deficiencies as well or possible deficiencies, you know, like, um, and since I started doing that, like, I feel really, really wonderful. You know, it's, it's crazy. Um, it was baffling. Like about six months ago, my blood pressure was like 130 over 75 or 130 over 80. And I was like, you know what? It was always my whole entire life. It was a 120 over 80 always so it just prompted me to just switch things up and lo and behold i actually had a physical the other day and my blood pressure was 118 over 68 so she was like wow that's great and i was like yeah yep. and it's all from like you know i'm i'm heavy on like <laughs> the vitamin B, b12 um i'm all in the methylated vitamins you know like um omegas and stuff like that so i'm just really trying to you know i wrestled a a lot of people say, "I'm brother, brother, I've been in the business 20 years, you know, but they had like 17 matches, you know, right. <laughs> like I, from, from the time, like from the time I've like 19, 20 years old, like I was pretty much getting on TV and WCW and it was straight through, you know, it was straight through to like WCW to WWE over to Japan then Mexico and Japan. And my body right now at age 46, you know, I still, I walk around, I see guys that, 
I look better still than most 25 years old in the gym, you know, and, and my conditioning's real good and stuff. But like, you know, I really started attacking the inside, you know, like really um, kind of like combating the physical harm I've done to my body over the years. Right. I yeah. To combat that with like, you know, nutritional and internal, you know. So to be honest, like when I stopped wrestling, it wasn't really because of anything. It was just like I kind of got burnt out. I never had a break, you know, I never had a break, never had a weekend off, never had a, you know, in, in, in Mexico, I was wrestling like when I was like, talk about LeBron, everyone's on LeBron shift being 38 and doing, I wrestled 270 matches in Mexico at age 38, you know what I'm saying? Like, right. it was, you know, and, and uh, it just wears on you, you know? So yeah. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I, but when I stopped, I thought, you know what? Like when I stop, everything's gonna heal up. It was just the opposite. It's like right. you, I was gonna ask when you that. When you stop, yeah. you die. When you stop, you literally die. Your body, you know, you, you see those like um, evolution pictures, the monkey turning into yeah. a human being. Like it was like it, <laughs> it literally. When you stop, your body starts curling up. You know, like I I constantly have to stretch out and open myself up and stuff because it, it's just. And I found that when I have something to train for. When I have something to shoot for, like these matches I'm doing, um, and I'm also possibly going to work in the states for the first time in a long time. Um, it's going to, I, it may be somewhere in North Carolina, uh, oh, cool. and I possibly could be working Chavo Guerrero. So, oh, amazing, awesome. So, stay tuned on my social media for that. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, man. Well, you know, there's been like, I feel like in wrestling now, what's really <laughs> popular is there's been like a resurgence of guys from your sort of area. You know, like we were just talking yeah. about. We had Chris Marcel on the show and we've had Santino on the show. And I kind of feel yep. like that era that you were in, say uh, specifically WWE, that kind of like ruthless aggression era. Now yeah. that's very nostalgic for the audience, if that makes sense. So there's kind yeah. of like, there's kind of like, um, there's an appetite for it again now, I feel. Yeah, definitely. And, and, and I kind of had the best of both worlds, you know, like I can, uh, when I'm north of the border, I'm Mark Jindrak. I'm the reflection right. of perfection, Mark Jindrak. South of the border, Marco Corleone, you know? So, <laughs> yeah, that, you, you, uh, you definitely got it good. So it's like, uh, you know, uh, I just, uh, I'm enjoying it because, like I, like, I do realize that, you know what, like, you just kind of wake up and realize, like, I, I have, I'm a kid at heart, you know? Like, we kind of hung on a little bit. I'm always goofing off and being a, you know, you know, that's how I am. I'm young, you know? Sure. So in my mind, the way I act and, like, from the clothes I wear, you know, walk around like the other 46 year olds aren't, aren't kind of conducting themselves like that. And I'm fine with that. I'm cool with it, you know. Um, but I just want to, you know, I I, I don't want to. In, in my mind, I'm young, but like I have to remember I'm 46 years old. So, you know, I, I I'm coming back with like not limitations, but in my head, like I need to. And it's kind of exciting. I need to work wrestle a different style, you know. Like I can't. I don't have that forty inch vertical anymore, you know. Like yeah, I can barely dunk a basketball, you know. And it, it sucks, you know, because <laughs> ten years ago I was doing three sixty windmills, you know. And um, so, so like I, I look forward to like when I'm gonna get my work in the gyms and stuff uh, leading up to the matches. I'm looking forward to, you know, working smarter, you know, working the people. Um, and it's gonna be fun working in America because I haven't worked in America in so long, you know. And right. Um, and then on the flip side, in Mexico, like, um, arguably, I had a, a bigger when I in my heyday there, like I, I was probably more popular outside of the ring than I was in the ring, you know. So, so I'm kind of a novelty there at, at the same time, you know. Like, yeah. When I was in Mexico with you, people kept stopping you asking for photos, and they kept saying that catchphrase to you from the soap opera. Picadillo. Picadillo. Yeah. 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 <laughs> And, and I was uh, like, "Wow!" I, was, I thought that was pretty. That was really fascinating for me to watch. It was. It was like. A, it was like the number one show in, in all of Mexico. Like and like before streaming came along. Like this is like maybe 2010. Before streaming came along, like literally the only place you could see it was on free open television in Mexico. You know, so mm -hmm. and a lot of people don't have cable television. You know, they right, have that right. that normal local channel, which was Televisa, and these ratings they were doing. You know, like. Um, like ratings, literally ratings, like 32, you know, 32, you know, people back in the day when raw would do like an eight, you know, people yeah, like, that's like crazy, yeah. out tears, we're doing like a 32 <laughs> with like a 56% share. Like it was like, that's insane. <laughs> that is crazy. and then, you know, the crazy thing about it too, was like, 
and I was probably more proud of this is like after they are hit the hit shows pass on Televisa, they go over to Univision in the United States and they play yes. on prime prime time Univision. Yeah. So I used to get the the ratings from Variety Variety like newsletter or whatever that month and uh, the, the ratings every night for network television. You know, be like Fox, ABC, NBC, CBS. Univision was part of that. And every night, like literally the, the 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 soap opera episodes where I was like starring in, I look at the ratings and we were like number four in America. You know, like it was like the Major League Baseball All Star Game, like some kind of reality cooking show, like The View or something. Or I mean, the yeah. the uh, that's that the the ju- what they judge or whatever. The Voice, The Voice. The voice, the voice, yeah, yeah, and then and then our uh, Porcela Mormonda was like number four in the nation, you know, and like number That's six crazy. was like Modern Family, number wow, eight man. was like two and a half, uh, two and a half men, you know, so it was it was kind of like that was kind of cool, like, and they did, you know, I got a lot of accolades in in, in uh, Latin America for my part, you know, so yeah, did, it was yeah. it was kind of cool, it was it was it was cool, it had and and the reason why that saying Picadillo hit because it was like. Like Arnold Schwarzenegger in the 90s here, I'll be back. Hasta la vista, baby. That's how my accent kind of sounded in Spanish. So when I said right. that threat, that taunt, they will ask their picadillo, people lost it. Like they, they thought it was the funniest <laughs> thing ever. And I didn't, I wasn't trying to be funny. I was just trying to get my line out correct, you know? So <laughs> how did, so how did wrestling, particularly WWE, kind of prepare you for the telenovelas? Because WWE is a solid pop for two, right? You know, to be honest, it didn't it didn't prepare me at all. And and, and to really? be honest, I, I dropped the ball. Like if if when I, when these novellas was going on were going on and, and like when Mexico, like when I was in CMLL early yeah. early years, like two thousand seven, two thousand eight, if you put that Mark Jindrak back in WWE, I think I really think that I could have had a really, really good run there, you know? And a mature Mark Jindrak. But no, when I was there, like mm. I didn't get I didn't give a shit about wrestling. Like to be honest with you, like I was I'd be bummed out, like, ah fuck. I got like I got three house shows to do and then raw. Like and there's a sweet party going on or something in Atlanta and I wanted to go to a party or you know, like it was, <laughs> it was ridiculous. But like at the same time I was six six, you know, like genetically like I was two hundred and fifty five pounds, probably like six percent body fat, had that vertical leap, like yeah. there weren't athletes like that really you know and and uh to be honest i just rested a lot on my uh, uh, just god-given abilities there i i yeah. i took wrestlemania weeks as like like vacation to hang out with everybody and stuff you know like it was um i just didn't take it seriously you know so so what happened but that that's how it prepared me because when i went when i got released in 2005 i was like I didn't think that ever released me, you know, and, and it really wasn't anything against me. It was just like the way WWE works is after WrestleMania, that quarter, right after WrestleMania, they cut, they cut stuff, you know, and, and be, before the um, pandemic cutting, that was, I was involved in the largest WWE cut ever, you know, like the Dudleys got cut in that, you know, the hall of famers, you know, so it's like, it's nothing. a conveyor belt. People get fired all the, like every year. Right. Yeah. And in fact, like six months, seven months later, I was still really, really tight with Randy Orton and uh, Rey Mysterio. It just so happened they were doing a show and like, it was like a Raw and SmackDown show and like, like Augusta, Georgia or something, Georgia. So they came in, flew to Atlanta and I drove them to the arena and just hung out, you know, backstage. It just so happened that day, Booker T came to Raw and would talk to Vince McMahon. As soon as Booker T was starting that um, Houston Championship Wrestling, whatever it was. Mm-hmm. And he was like, we let go of some guys that we could have probably made in the stars. Like, I think he named like uh, he named me. He named Charlie Haas and maybe I think Mordecai. Um, but he named me, and just so happens I was there that afternoon. And Vincent Mann basically hired me back on the spot. He was like, oh, you know, really? I uh, you know appreciate what you've been doing in Mexico, and I've heard you've been in Japan, but uh, I think you still you can make some money here. And I was like. He told me to give uh, Johnny Laronitis, Johnny Ace, a call. And he told me to call uh, go to Deep South Wrestling, which was run by Hugh Morris. And to be honest, like, Hugh Morris and me weren't the best of friends in WCW. I thought he I, I thought he was always a martyr, you know, like being a martyr, overselling shit. Like, I don't know. We just had heat. 
and and he didn't like me i didn't like him and like when i got the deep south i felt like he was just kind of fucking sticking it to me you know like and at that time i was kind of getting over in mexico this was like the early i was flip-flopping i Mex- uh, japan was kind of i like japan stuff but like uh, it was just man I, I was still in that mode of like having fun and stuff and like you know you've been on those three four week tours of japan like those things get long and yeah, it's serious stuff, and you know, you're 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 flipped upside down. Like it's it's four in the morning, you just wake up for no reason, or it's oh, like yeah. three in the afternoon, you just you'll zonk out. Like someone be talking to you, you'll just fucking fall asleep. And it was like it was messed up. Like the the language, it was really really tough. And I just like, and like I said, I didn't like wrestling that much. To be honest, I didn't like it that much. It was, you gotta love wrestling to do that. Plus, as well, like the mm-hmm. times you went to Japan, obviously, like the mid two thousands. All the times yeah. I went to Japan was kind of like 2015 onwards. So I had my phone, my internet, my laptop. You guys yeah. back then probably a little bit different, huh? Yeah, about yeah, about 2006 ish. Yeah, um, yeah. And then and then, but then I went to Mexico, and I'm like, okay, well, this is from Atlanta. It was a two hour and 45 minute flight. That's a plus. Um, one, they're in Central Time. Um, the language is if you break it down, there's a lot of language, there's a lot of words in Spanish and English that are exactly the same, just pronounced differently. Um, they just were at that time, they were just it was a hotter wrestling bed. Mexico 2006, Mystico was the Mystico Paraguayo, Dr. Wagner, I, uh, La Parca, uh, Dos Cartas, Alberto Del Rio. Um, and then I come on the board there, a guy named Alex Kozlov. I don't know, uh, yeah, I know him um rocky was there rocky romero so it was just like we were having a great time and you know and, and uh it was so so it was like this decision was easy so i went to i went to mexico and it was still fun there you know and like i said like it just worked my style worked there you know because i like jumping around and doing all these fancy stuff i wasn't your chain wrestler per se or you know i wasn't going to show you anything you know on the mat you know but like i was like leapfrogging three people and you know drop kicking people like having somebody hold up another guy eight feet in the air and drop kick him in the face you know that was stuff where, like i was starting to get over just on jumping and then they had that ramp and i would use that ramp as my right. runway and literally yeah. like it got over when i when i i started noticing that i was getting over and i was a i was a rudo a heel and um it was just man it was an easy decision i was like you know what i see money here um, because while they're looking at Mystico, every Friday night, 12,000, 13,000, 14,000 people in hot. And guess who his partner was? Me. You know, like I was usually his partner and I was the third. But guess what? If you're looking at Mystico, you're also going to see me. Right. With that time, like I said, like it just, I, I kind of hit just like Vampiro hit in the 90s. You know, there's, right. You know, so it was really it was, interesting at the time, just like, because, you know, I'd seen you in WCW and then seen you in WWE and then just like, a few years later, like hearing these rumblings, like, oh, Mark Jean Drag's like a really big star in Mexico now. And I was like, really? That's that seems random. It was, it was weird. <laughs> yeah, it was random. It was it was really, really random. But uh but truth be told, like uh my end towards the end of WWE, like my best friends uh and travel partners were were Eddie Guerrero and Ray Mysterio. Like I was on SmackDown with them and it was right before I got released right before their feud kind of started, you know. Mm. So um Wait, wait, I just had they... a really, I just had a really, really close tie to the Mexican culture for some reason, you know, like it, and uh, You're drawn to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, you know, your, so your wife's Mexican as well, right? Yeah, yep. Uh, I met her. She's from Guadalajara, a place called Guadalajara. I met her um, in 2014. Um, you know, we have a child. He's seven years old. Uh, um, you know, we're obviously here in America already, right? and she, uh, you know, she's adapted. She likes it. Her English is pretty good, um, you know, but, uh, you know, we have close ties to Mexico always, you know. Of course. I was going to say, so you'd already, like, you'd been in WCW, you were WCW tag team champion. Then you did WWE. You'd, done, you'd already done, like, a WrestleMania and a, a bunch of other stuff. So I guess when they asked you, like, hey, we want you to go to Deep South, I assume you saw that as, like, a... A step well, down, right? Not, not really, because at that time, you know, there was some pretty good stars and name like MVP was a rookie there. You know, like mm-hmm. young MVP. Um, it's just like I just kept going. You know, like I, I kept weighing it out. Like I, 
the, the thing I hated the most, I, I didn't, I, I look back and I didn't hate it. Now that I look back, like the OVW and stuff, you know, it was, but like it sucked, like the first few years of my career, it went from, we're in the power plant and then they think, you know what, WCW is kind of dying. So let's throw these young guys, these athletic dudes on TV, they're green. But let's see if we can, you know, start a fire before it eventually went under. But WWE, we were on TV enough in WCW to where, and not paid those big salaries like the big guys were making, where WWE b- bought WCW and they're like, you know, Sean O'Hare come with me, Mark Jindrak come with me, Palumbo come with me. Right there, you got three guys, six foot six, and all 255 and up, you know, athletic, still real young and stuff. Uh, Stasiak, you know, another one. Um, so, like, early on, like, you know, we got a, a chance right away just, you know, just to go over to WWE. When, when, um, when did you find out WCW was going under and like, what was your reaction and how long in between that? And when did you realize that WWE were going to pick you up? Can you remember all that? Or I just, I remember when the the crowd started going down more and more and more and more. Like I luckily, like I got really lucky when I decided to take the wrestling journey. Um, and I went to the power plant. I started training at the power plant, you know, three, four months, you know, bump learn how to bump and do all that stuff and one day like terry taylor came down to the power plant and he was like um he looks around and he points to me he points to mike sanders he points to alan funk um he's like you guys want to you guys want to do uh tv security at, at uh nitro and thunder i was like yeah and we got to go on the road like early on i get to go on the road to every nitro and every oh, thunder. Wow. and it was awesome and we got paid too like 300 bucks a a gig like so it was i was and then i come home and train i'd come back to atlanta and train for three days of the week but like i'd learn immensely on on the road just picking everyone's brain and the great thing about wcw was all the me i grew up on the wwf like at that that wrestlemania three era right around right, right there the my favorite wrestlers are ravishing rick rude mr perfect or henning uh million dollar man um so when I at that time in WCW, when I go on the road at the bars down downstairs at the hotel and stuff, like I'd get the drink and hang out with Mr. Perfect, Rick Rude. Um, um, I get to hang out with um, who was it like Kevin Nash and Scott Hall. Like, I, I like it, it was like a fast track. Like, I make the decision to drop out of school, become a wrestler, and then it was almost like validation because I do stuff on TV security. Uh, my friends would be watching at home. They'd see me walking behind Eric Bischoff or something. <laughs> You'd see me like, I saw Mark, you know, and like, oh, they're like, oh, yeah, they're bringing him along. You know, they've got a plan for him. So it just made, like, quickly validation, you know. So, um, you know, and then, uh, so the power, but the power plant was, was just, it was kind of fun. It, it was like, almost like, and when they threw us all on TV in WCW, it was almost like the first day of school with all your friends. You know, like, right, we, we, we didn't have any of those pressures and probably like on the flip side, we probably had heat or had right. like gave zero fucks, you know, like <laughs> gave zero fucks. Like we zero. What um, did you, uh, with, with Vince Russo was the booker at the time, right? So he would have been the one to bring you on. What, yeah. Did you, did you have a relationship with Russo? And if you did, like, what was that like? He just, he just liked, the uh, uh, like those guys to be, he, he, when, when he was kind of taken over, he, He'd come in the power plant when you know the offices were when the, the new power plant when they when we said they started paying us were in the headquarters where um the WCW like offices were as well. Right. And um you know, so he'd come in and check, you know, when he was doing business or something there or whatever in the office, he'd come and check out the talent and stuff. So he just liked us. He liked our vibe, you know. He came in and it they, we, they, we became the natural born thrillers. That's what that we became. So it was like uh you know, it was a youthful like movement kind of, you know, and, and that's literally what it was. And, um, you know, a lot of people say uh, like they got their, you know, uh, opinion about him and stuff. But like I've always stayed neutral because he gave me my opportunity, you know, so. Sure. I've always liked another fu- another fun story, too, like um, as I'm on the subject, because because the offices were right and where we trained as well. Um, one afternoon, there was uh, one after myself and Sean O'Hare were were training in the power plant. Just nobody, uh, nobody was there. It was like after hours, 
And lo and behold, in comes um, Gene Simmons and his son. And Gene Simmons was there inking the deal for that demon character towards the oh, end of the Oh, yeah. So he just want, he wanted to see some wrestling. He's like, I want to see some wrestling. So the office people took to see if anyone was in there. And Sean and I were wrestling. So we did like a little five or six minute exhibition for Gene Simmons and his son. <laughs> That's so it was pretty funny. crazy. So That's so fun. And this is all when you were like in your very early twenties as well, right? Um, like, yep. It was, I, I got, I was probably about, about 21 years old. I think I, I signed the contract. My first, I signed my contract, um, April 7th, uh, 1999. So wow. at that time I was, um, still, I was 21 years old so and my, and I actually got my first nitro. We did like the Saturday night, uh, Saturday night wrestling and stuff, or whatever it was, WCW Saturday night, whatever. But my our, for my first Nitro was uh, my twenty third birthday. So. Wow, that's so that's so young. Have you yeah. seen? I I I think I meant to send it to you. Have you seen that meme? And it says something like, "You don't know pop music if you can't name this boy band." And it's a picture of the Natural Born Thrillers. Have you seen that? No, I have not. With, you, with your top off, yeah, it was going around, kind of viral, on, at least wrestling viral. Yeah, it's just a picture of like all you natural born for this with your tops off and it's like pretending you're a boy band it's pretty funny did um here's a question so when you say so the natural born thrillers did they kind of give you like any creative pitch for how it was going to be or was it literally just a case of your young guys your arrogant your athletes go be you they they just had like yeah kind of like that and uh you know we uh, it was just like we were green. All of us were green, you know. So we just kind of did what they told us to do to the best of our ability. And right. there was a point in time, like towards the end, like we were literally like we'd be on like six different segments, you know, right. for the show. And uh, so they used to call us like the natural born rating killers. I know that was a, a top, a top, the rating killers. And I was like, you know what? Like I was glad we got our chance. And and. Yeah. Um, it was like because WCW was was when it was going down. It had its peak, and and it just the the business model wasn't wasn't set up like you were kind of paying guys more that were producing less. You know, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's there was a, a point in time where like you, you get you get away with the Gaga and the oh my god the Star Factor like oh this is amazing the factions and stuff you know like oh the, you know and. At some point in time, the guys are getting paid, a, you know, a few million bucks and just sitting at home, not even coming to TV, you know, and guaranteed contracts and stuff. And it just doesn't, you know, when the ratings were going down, it was just like they're bleeding money, you know. So right, it's no wonder really that it went out of business. When, yeah. when, when they did, we when... saw the we saw the writing on the wall. I mean, like we weren't the. So when I would do that TV security and stuff, and I remember the crowd still being. I remember looking around the crowd and stuff, and going, "Wow, this is this this crowds are hot," you know. And right. then, and then when we got on, it was still they're still hot, and then it was just like it was downhill. Then they then they started doing two shows on the same show, like Nitro yeah. and Thunder taped together, and it was just like, God, it was like overkill. It was horrible. Um, and that was that was like the beginning of the end, pretty much, you know. And, right. But I, but I wasn't like, like I said, I was still, I was still green, too green to know if it was good or bad. Right. But, but confident enough, like I think you know, like if you're a company that's gonna rip any talent from, like I figured it was gonna be me and my crew because we're all young. We got that at that time. WW, WWF had that look. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah, yeah. it's still, like they weren't. They weren't giving the belt to Eddie Guerrero or Rey Mysterio or guys like uh, Chris Benoit yet, you know. Like it was still kind of like the land of the giants, you know. Even the rings were they're kind of built for the tall, taller guys, you know. And, and uh, so it was our look was like your traditional type, you right. know, cookie cutter WWE guy, you know. So were um, you were you um, like oh, two part question. So obviously, were you like excited? Obviously, when you got the call from the WWE, or they I guess they just told you that they were carrying your contract over. And um, of course, like the first thing you do in WWE is the whole alliance storyline. Um, yeah. What did you make of all that? Obviously, I, I think you were in the is it the opener or at least one of the first matches on the Invasion pay per view, working with APA. How was all that? Just going straight into oh, the no, that was um, that was Palumbo and O'Hare. Right? Oh, sorry. 
My bad. I worked. I was. I was fortunate enough to guy work guys like more like um, uh, who did I wrestle? Uh, um, Jerry Lynn. Like he was okay. really easy. Um, but you were a part of the alliance. I definitely remember that much, right? Yeah, yeah. But but like I said, like I, my my greenness. We're all you know. We're all green in WCW, mm-hmm. and and a lot, a lot of the older veterans weren't pumping out a decent product either. So it was like, you know, would you rather see a shitty product with a shitty work, uh, with but athletic rather than guys that don't do anything and shitty, you know? So right, it's just. Um, but when we got to WWE, a lot of us got exposed. You know, like we 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 had to go back to, we went to OVW and and. That's why I felt like, you know, we really learned how to work and stuff, you know, like, you know, the put on those, the put on those TV type matches, right. um, you know, really work a hold rather than just hitting a hold, uh, um, working cameras, uh, things of that sort. But, you know, like I was still immature, but I was maturing in one, like, that was like a wrestling factory at the time, you know, that was when Cena, Batista, Orton, you know, all those guys were there. Shelton Benjamin, Charlie Haas. It was packed with like 25 people that were going to be on TV the next like 15 years of wrestling, you know? So, um, did you have to move to Louisville? I did. I moved to Louisville. I still had a house in Atlanta. That kind of sucked. Um, because I'd, you know, you want to be home. Like you dream of just, you know, being at home. You know? Right. Because I was still living out of the hotel. It's not like I could go and let me get an apartment. So I have a home and an apartment, and I was leaving, you know. So I stayed in one of those like hotels the uh, week to week, you know. The oh geez, had a, li- had a little kitchen and stuff, you know. Which which I, honestly I like. I like I like I like small like I like hotel rooms. I don't know why I just <laughs> I feel comfortable in them, you know. Really? Yeah, I enjoy it. I I don't know. I sleep well in them. It's weird. Um, <laughs> but like, yeah. It, it, um, but it was, it was, you know, I, you liked OVW then. Yeah, I didn't mind it. I didn't mind looking back on it. I didn't mind. It. I made friends. You know, like it was a chance to reset and almost like arrive again. You know, like I'd already arrived in WCW and then kind of disappeared for a while, and then then I got back on TV and WWE and and um, you know, it, it definitely just when people want to because the same people that cheer for you, you know, from your hometown and stuff that when you get on. The same people that kind of, then you're off for a second. They're like, yeah, I knew he wouldn't last, you know, or, <laughs> right. ah. and then you're back, you know. Oh, and I know that, it, yeah. <laughs> you know, it, so it was like, it, it was, um, but still, like, uh, to be honest with you, I, I I didn't love the business. And that, you know, if you want to use this for a segue, that's kind of where I went wrong in WWE. You know, like, I arguably had a, million dollar multi-million dollar opportunity with being an evolution i was gonna um, say it seems like you should have made millions of dollars in the wrestling industry i mean i'm sure you made some pretty decent money but i guess i always say with wrestling you you've got to kind of love it to really be successful i feel right absolutely no you're absolutely, absolutely your right thing. and i you know it, wasn't, it just wasn't like i said like i i my dream was like nba like yeah. um you know you watch these american sports like here in america like here in america it's not you don't you know, it's a, it's like a novelty. Like, you know, it's a, it's very, it's a niche. And if you're not part of that small group, like, you, you know, that's why I kind of liked about Mexico. Mexico, like, you read the results in the newspaper the next day. Like, they they right. covered it like sports. You know, so. Uh, but like I said, like, I I originally became a wrestler because, athletically speaking, I was an athlete. I was I, I really was a really really you know I could run fast. I could jump high. I was had good endurance and agility, all this stuff. And, and I just felt like I'd be wasting God's gifts by being a, working a nine to five somewhere or working construction or doing something like a being an electrician, nothing against those. But like, I felt like I was to be an athlete, you know, Absolutely. To, have the, to have the greatest drop kick of all time. <laughs> right. I've got, oh. you, uh, go on, Sam. Sorry. You, you just talked about your kind of like God given attributes. Okay. Like a big, tall strong yet agile guy right i've got to ask this because this has bothered me for about 19 years and now i've got the opportunity to ask 
do you feel like they did you dirty on the on Day of Reckoning? You know, the video game. They gave you a fifty-four in the attributes, and that <laughs> spoiled you know, my like, place I, for I, like I, years. I I know, like Stacey Keebler had, I think it's str- I think she, yeah. Around. Hang on, Stacey um, Keebler had more. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like, like <laughs> yeah. I was, they made me fucking weak. It's like the greatest injustice in video game wrestling history, in my opinion. And now yeah. I've got a chance to actually bring it up. But, but um, you know, w, WWE, um, they 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 give everyone the same percentage um, royalties and stuff. So, you know, um, whether it had like 50 power or 99 power or whatever, like the, the royalty checks were, that's where you kind You're of good. Yeah, fun. okay. Yeah. Cool. So, so I didn't care. Like I make oh, as long as you the, <laughs> you don't, I yeah. just care about getting in the game. You know, just, fair getting, enough. Getting yeah. on. Well, you were in two others, weren't you? You were in SmackDown versus Raw, and then well, Raw versus SmackDown, and then 2006. Uh, yep, 2006. And Even though I was released the, in 2005, I made the last cut. You know, luckily. Nice. Yes, they they did. I think they were nice to you in those. I think they gave you like 78. And it's still yeah. a little low, but they, they didn't carry over the 54. But actually, yeah. I'm glad you brought this up. Do you have any... So I know nowadays they all kind of like, they go in and they spend a day and they get their faces scanned and stuff. Back in the PS2 era and GameCube era, was there anything on your part that you had to do? Was there a day of work when they come to the scan you nope. for the video game or did you just sign papers? What happened? Here nope, uh, uh, for for that. Um, um, I will, well, the video game, well, the action figures... Well, you had there was a day where these people were on site, like in a big, like made makeshift uh, tent or something outside, where you'd sit and they would do a complete rotation mm, and yeah. get your whole. That's why the you know those action figures were pretty straight, you know, pretty on in terms of our face characteristics and stuff. And uh, but it's, in terms of the video game, um, that was all motion captions. Mm-hmm. Um, and and did you I, have to do that? We didn't have to do it. There there was. The, the kind of the rookies did and, and I guess but I did that before so when I was in the WCW power plant um I'm sure they do it the same way with WWE but when I, I was do, in WCW yeah. a video game was coming out and they grabbed like a few of us um to go a tall guy I was a tall guy so I was doing like the moves they, they put all those balls on you those suit with the yeah. balls it was in Vancouver so electronic arts in Vancouver yeah. which by the way Vancouver is amazing um so I, for a week, I just did every day from like, you know, 9 to 3, 10 to 3 or something. They put me in this suit and stuff, and I would do all the big guy moves, like, you know, the Kevin yeah. Nash, yeah. power bomb, you know, stuff like that, and people on crash pads and stuff. So, so yeah, that was... That's uh, awesome. Yeah, but that's how, that's how it's I wonder done. what I game that was. I wonder what game that was. Would that it be was, Nitro? Uh, I, 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 probably. I wasn't in that yeah. game, so... Yeah, but you well, your performance was. My performance was... <laughs> So, it is a question mark. I, I feel like Vince McMahon would have took one look at you and just instantly fell in love. Yeah. Did you have any type of relationship with Vince or any kind of fun interactions with him at all? Um, you know, he, he used to think me and Orton, you know, our, our, uh, we were always goofing off. He used to, he used to like our youth, you know, our youth, you know, he used to, um, and that was the whole thing, you know, in the, that, they did that documentary and so Triple H did old, not like the youth, but Vince did. Vince did. Vince did. And 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 the thing I don't like about some of that shit is like the story's told, but it's told it's told in the light that, you know, the only thing I can say is like Triple H in the whole video said, you know, like uh, me and me and Rick, you know, didn't think it was a good choice, you know, Jindrak was a good choice. And Vince McMahon said yes, but I said no, it's not a good choice. Like like the, the how I remembered it was like, like for example, these car rides. Like when we when we were going to be the group Evolution, Trip Triple H wanted to um, rent the car for the loop. Flair would be on the the loop, and me and Orton. So we'd all ride from town to city to city for the four day loop, in you know Lincoln or something. And and Triple H wanted to talk like you know wanted to talk about wrestling and like okay here's the situation hot tag and. You know, get get all the boys talking and stuff. And it always turned into like, you know, me and Orton just being wild and, and Flair loved our wildness, you know, like he'd get all fired up and stuff. Boys, you know, what do you, you know? <laughs> like he we would go to restaurants and he'd be like, you know, boys, you know, we're gonna do a, a radio interview and I want 
I want you to hook up with the girls and pictures, and I want pictures on your cell phone tomorrow. And <laughs> Triple H would whisper in our ears, like, don't you dare, you dipshits. He calls dipshits. Um, so he was like, you know, like, they had every right to kick me out of the group. Like, um, because when I wasn't on the tour, when I wasn't on the loop, Orton would be by himself, and it was like, you know, he would take kindly to learning and learning the, you know, stuff like that. But when I was there, it was fun time again. You know, him and I had a great time, and it just didn't it didn't work out. And and who was the one who's gonna get the shaft? Was it me, a first generation wrestler, or Orton, who already they're impressed with, third generation wrestler, had all the tools. It was in his blood. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, yeah, they would never let him go. <laughs> yeah, it was the obvious choice. You know, so um, they gave me they get like. I had so many opportunities to like, you know, it's just, I just wasn't until I got released from it. I just didn't give a shit. You know, like I didn't, I didn't give a shit. Like it, it like I take that back. I gave a shit. I was timid, you know, like I was too scared all the time, but at the same time, like not really pay attention. It was, it was a weird dynamic. And then when I went to Mexico, it was a completely different thing, you know? So, you, you lose that, oh, my God, like, I, I've studied to be a wrestler. I've learned, I've perfected everything I can to be a wrestler, and now I'm not a wrestler? Now what, you know? Mm-hmm. So, you know, I couldn't do the 9 to f- I couldn't do the 9 to 5 thing back when I was 21. I was 6'5", 235 pounds. Now, now I'm 6'6", 253. I got to go back to a 9 to 5, and I was like, fuck, you know? And that's why I started tra- trying out Mexico and Japan and stuff, so... Um, that, and that's when I learned how to get over, you know, uh, it was like, you know what, like, if you don't give a shit, it's going to be the same thing for you here, you know? Mm-hmm. So I immediately took it seriously in Mexico and, and learned the language and, and learn the traditions and learn what got heat and, and pick people's brains like, like Eddie Guerrero, you know, and, and, uh, um, uh, Ray, um, even lo and behold, like it was strangely enough, like, I was going to an Atlanta Falcons game one time, and um, Chris Benoit um, was with his son going to the game. He tapped me on the back of his shoulder. I, he goes, I heard you're in Mexico doing well. And he, he, even I picked his brain, you know, because he was a, a star in Mexico, you know. So I, I just um, I took it real serious. I didn't, know, I didn't know the politics of it. You know, I didn't know who was who, who's over, who's not over. I just – I almost was like Brock Lesnar when he first came on the scene, you know. Like, hey, sorry about it. They want me to. Gar- they want me to power bomb you through a fucking garbage can. Sorry about it, dude. I'm getting over. It, you know? <laughs> when when you did get over in Mexico, um, did I always wondered this? Like, did WWE come back calling, or did I know TNA was pretty big back then? And like, you worked with Kurt Angle no, in no. WWE, and then he was in TNA. Did TNA try to reach out, or WWE reach no, out? Again? No, TNA never. I I, I kind of really. I, kinda, I, I don't know if I had heat. I don't know if I had heat with them or something, but like. Um, Did you get on with Kurt when you worked with him? Who? Uh, Kurt, Kurt Angle? Angle? Yeah. Uh, no, not really. Not, not. Re- I mean, kind of, sort of. <laughs> at that time, at that time, he had a, he had that that um, he was going through his issues and stuff, you know, with um, pain pain management uh-huh. and stuff. So I, I wasn't getting a true reading on him, anyways. You know, like he probably, if you were to ask him, he probably wouldn't remember. And, and we had long conversations and stuff, you know, like. It was just a different time. WWE, the wrestling was a different time, and and um, you know, I'm, I'm glad he's doing better. I don't, you know, I, I don't really keep in touch with many people. Um, I talked to Ray the other day. Um, you know, talked about it's crazy. His son Dominic's doing so well right now. You know, like um, I remember from being good friends with Ray back on SmackDown back in 2004. Like Dominic was probably like I don't know five five years old, six years mm-hmm. old. Um, it's just crazy, and you know now I should flip on the TV, and he's getting mega heat. And, he's all you know, over he's getting, the show. Yeah, he's getting confidence. You know, he's got his. He really kind of get, learned his character and stuff. And to be honest, like that's that's what I kind of learned. If you you know, like I was always like, like I said, I just never. I learned how to work like how I wanted to work, you know. But like, learn like I wasn't William Regal, you know what I'm saying? Like, right, and. um <laughs> You know, and Mexico like kind of allowed me to be that way. You know, like I said, so that's that's why you know I kind of 
gravitated towards that. It was actually the right move, you know. And like I said, I left probably millions on the table because of the whole evolution thing, fall fallout. But um, you know, Mexico, like from traveling with guys like like in Raw, like when I always travel with Randy Orton, and then I go to SmackDown, I travel with Rey Mysterio and Eddie Guerrero. Guess who was the on the low end of the totem pole when people want autographs and stuff? Like I was like, you know you know, like 20 people would be in a pile and they'd all wait for Ray and Eddie and then they'd ask my, for me, my autograph, you know? So I, I just, I, I wasn't a hater or anything. I just envisioned, I was like, you know what? Man, I've ever, how do I, you know, and I'd try to figure it out, wrap it around my head. So when I went to Mexico and, and I started getting over, like, I, it, I enjoyed it, you know? Like, that's probably one of the reasons why I never really even, like, investigated coming back to WWE because, it felt so good being an over, you know, I was, I was really <laughs> over. It, it felt amazing. And, and it wasn't just being over as a wrestler, like, Oh, in, in the States, the United States, people don't understand like, Oh, you're over as a wrestler. Like there's probably 10 to 15 guys in a, wrestlers in America that they'll, they might, you know, like really get sweated in the mall or something. You know, most guys can go into the radar, but like in Mexico, like I, everyone's the average heights, like, heights like five foot seven. I'm six six, you know. Stick out big time. Yeah. All the wrestlers wear masks. I don't, you know. Um, and I was getting mainstream gigs on TV, like you know, like Good Morning America here to our country is a, yeah. a program called Oi. There, I would go on that program and just do like the most ridiculous shit. Take my shirt off, flex, talk with my biceps, have my biceps <laughs> talk Spanish. Oh, I come. So and it got over, like it got over. And so I was getting over in mainstream Mexico. Right. And that was different from, you know, like it was different than, um, and that was probably the, the biggest feather in my cap. In 2009, at the height of my popularity, probably in Mexico, WWE was kind of hitting the TV there. Like they, they hit that Televisa channel, free TV. And people just fell in love with it and stuff, you know, but like, and they did a tour in Mexico. So Ray was there. Um, Batista was there. A lot of, you know, big stars from WWE. And uh, I was there hanging out with them, obviously. And probably I was getting more love than all they were getting love, you know, because I was a mainstream star. You know, that goes right. further than the wrestling. Like, I was on main hit TV shows, you know, like like number one. And, and I was just really, really fortunate, you know. And then when, then when I got over on the outside – my job even became easier on the inside of the ring because right. then, you know, then I would do my like ravaging. I got that ravaging Rick, Hick, uh, Rick, uh, Rick, Rick rude hip swivel over. <laughs> and that was like my, like, right. like that was my taunt, you know, it was, that's it was what you had to do really. Huh? All I had to jump? do, all I had to do, all I had to do, you know, like <laughs> the great thing is like, I had the girls in my, palm of my hand you know so like sometimes if the crowd was more heelish brutalish which arena max was a tough arena you know mm-hmm. and i'd be getting the boo sometimes the boo birds would be out Ooh. but i would do one hip swivel and five thousand girls would just swallow that ah! we just swallow those boos alive i'd be like shut your mouth clown i own <laughs> your ladies i own your ladies but it was That's- a great time and, and Rocky, and then, you know, Rocky, I had Rocky Romero and Alex Caldwell. They were my best friends there. And it was just a really, really great time, man. So I guess just to sum things up. So like your whole career, you know, you're a WCW, you're a WCW. You won the tag titles at WCW, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah, you won the tag titles. You had your run in the WWE, WWF, you know, you were part of a WrestleMania. I'm sure you got a trading card in WWE. I know you got an action figure, video games. Then this big career in Mexico with CMLL and, and, and AAA, what would you say overall was like your career highlight or sort of the, the most important moment to you during your like wrestling career? Because obviously we know everything that it led to outside of wrestling, but just wrestling as a whole. Because I know you said, you know, you didn't really care about wrestling as much, but was there something that really stood out to you? Like I'm sure doing MSG, WrestleMania would have been really cool. And I don't know. You, I, think, I, I, think, I think probably the... To think back probably in the wrestling career, I, I think it was probably um, in CMLL, I won the heavyweight title. Um, and I think I was the like the only American ever to win it, you know, right. in the history. You know, like guys, like other notable names that, like that people would recognize. Well, like Val Venus, he's Canadian, mm-hmm. obviously. 
Sean Morley. I forget, yeah. I forget what he went, went as a. Um, Wasn't he Metal Master or something like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, something or? like that. So he was hmm. there. Um, you know, like those guys, like you know, Eddie Guerrero was there and his partner um, Art uh, Art Bar. Art Bar. Um, Jericho was there. Obviously, um, but they, they were never champion. Norman Smiley. He's not. I don't think he's American. He's from a. So, but he's he, actually I, British. He's British. He. I think he may have won the championship there. But uh, Vampiro came to Canada. You know, like. So I was the first American ever to win it, you know, and and uh, you know I, I think that that um, highlight. Also, in the, I'm in a mall. There's a, call, a mall called Plaza de las Estrellas, mm. Plaza of the Stars. Um, I got my hands engraved in the floor at that at that plaza, which is kind of wow. I was kind of that was kind of over. Dude, yeah. Like it, it's just really funny because I feel like coming from American wrestling, like lucha libre or wrestling in Mexico, it's really hard to kind of transition into do you know what i mean it's such a different i almost say like lucha libre is like a whole different entity to like american pro wrestling so it seems like you somehow found that transition really easy somehow yeah you know it, it was sometimes it was just it's being the right place at the right time and like like i said like vampiro um was really over in the 90s there and yeah. they were just at that time like i said mystico the crowds were hot so it's like it's like I was just, it was already on fire, but right. I was a big can, I was a big can of gasoline at the time, you know, and, and it worked. And I was, and also I saw the potential right from the get go. I automatically, you know, like I, I never did any really like indies after, after I got released from WWE, like I did new Japan stuff. Like I felt like it was just like, it was just one, one off. Like there was no, like I wanted to be part of like a storyline or something, mm. you know, and, and Mexico gave me that, you know, a f show every Friday in arena, Mexico. Um, like I said, they, they, um, they covered the results in the newspaper, you know, like when I changed from when I made the, the big jump from bad guy to good guy there, like I was on the front page of the sports section, you know, me doing right. my Superman flight. Um, it was just, everything just worked. It just, it just, it worked the right place, right time. Uh, you know, um, and then sometimes timing is just everything, you know. Obviously, I put work in, and sure, you know, I, you know, but like it just was perfect, the perfect situation. Uh, that ramp was there with for my dive. Uh, it just, um, I, 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 started, I started learning how to really like high fly, like do planches outside of the ring and stuff, cross bodies outside of the ring because these Mexican guys they, they're, they're crazy, you know, like right, they land like cats. I've seen so many guys almost eat. shit. And somehow they always land all right, you know, like right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the worst, the worst fucking muffs ever, and they they always are all right, you know. So, so I, I, you know, don't, that probably my whole highlight. I would say just Mexico in general, like you yeah, know, yeah. Because because one thing is for like everybody, especially in my time, you know, TNA was on the up, but like it wasn't a player, a major player yet. Like WWE right. was the end all be all. After WCW went out, it was the end all be all. And in everyone's mind, it was five plus five. That's the only way you get to 10, five plus five. But like I, I went and did it eight plus two, you know, like there's right. other ways, you know, it, there's other ways to do it. You know, like the, the, then uh, some guys started doing New Japan, you know, like, you know, guys that weren't really, they're kind of dragging their feet with in the United States, like a guy like Tama Tonga or uh, Juice Robinson or something where they're like not really getting the rotten and developmental. They say, you know what? They'll give me a chance in fucking New Japan. Like things started popping up like that. Like and and you know, I think in the from the time I first went there to like the time I left, complete overhaul of integration. Like like all the styles. Just it's crazy how many people came through CMLL over the years. You know, from oh, yeah. Prince Devitt, um, aka Finn. You know, Finn mm -hmm. Balor. Uh, um, you know, guys like like TNA actually came in and did something like they um, did a whole like uh, AJ Styles was there. You know, like guys came through all the time. Like and uh, it's just it's crazy how everything right now is just so global. You know, it's it's awesome and it, like it's so crazy that WWE definitely isn't the just five. You know, there's, there's now there's you can even get over on the indies and make a good living on the indies sometimes. Yeah. Here. Oh yeah. You know, like if you're smart about it and now you know like in. in uh, especially with monetization of like uh, you know social media and stuff, and and it's just a lot of avenue for guys uh, to make make a, a living and earning you know for their family. So so it's great, um, you know.
Absolutely, dude. Well, you know, that's what we're trying to do here on this podcast, yeah. monetize. Um, I know you haven't got too much time and you've got your family and everything to deal with. So, um, Mark, thank you so much for joining us. Where can we find Thanks. you on the social media as you brought it up? Um, shoot, man. I'm, you don't really yeah. do Instagram, you told me. That's why we, we, I, we t- I, it took I, a few I, weeks I, to I get look, this sorted. <laughs> I was throwing stuff and I'll post every once in a while. I think I'm at, it's at Marco Corleone or you know, Gindrak one or something. <laughs> we'll put it up up. I'll find it yeah. and put it up. And in the okay. episode description as well, I'll plug your eBay site as well. There we go. Mark, Gind- Mark Gindrak cards. Mark Gindrak, Mark Gindrak cards, cards at eBay. Yeah. We'll, we'll get them on there. Don't you worry. That'd be awesome. <laughs> and when are those, when are those uh, next dates, the Robles promotion ones? Or where um, are they? The, those dates are going to be uh, February 16th, 17th, and 18th. That's Mexico, Mexico City, Saltillo, and Monterrey, Mexico. I've- I think I might be booked somewhere else that weekend already, but if I'm not, I'm going to text Rob Liz and try and get on there. That's get on there, man. <laughs> get on there again. That would be maybe awesome. We could, maybe you know, maybe we can turn that three way dance into a two on two. You know, there we go. I can do a hip swivel. I can do it. <laughs> two couple long. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. No, well, thank, um, thank yeah. you so much, Mark. Really appreciate time. You've been great. Very generous with your time and very honest. So thank you so oh, thank much. Thank you, Marty. Buddy. Thank you, Sam. Definitely. Thank I've, you good so luck with your program Mark. and stuff, and, and uh, I'll, I'll be checking it out, man. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you, Mark. Thank you. Take Thank care. you, bro. Glad to. That interview was really fun, right? Really cool. I loved it. Awesome. Awesome interview yeah. with Mark Jean Drag. I want to thank him for giving us that time. Very yeah. open, very honest. Intriguing, huh? You just think, after this interview, I just was left a question in my head, like, man, if he, if he just, you know, cared more about wrestling he probably could have been such a Mm. big superstar but it's just i guess it just wasn't for him and that's that's okay do you know i mean he's into something else but he definitely had the potential to be like multi-time world champion and everything else so it's interesting to think what could have been but at the same time just talking to him it sounds like he's had a really incredible life and career seems really happy doing what he's doing now so I think that's really, really cool. Do you ever, when you ask a question, you don't know where it's going to go. And then they reveal something that you find really interesting that you've never heard before. Like when you talk about Shane McMahon measuring him touching the the ceiling pole, like at the stadium, do you ever think afterwards, it's like, oh, I wonder like if I asked a different question, what other kind of slice of trivia would we find out or bring into the world about this wrestler that no one's ever heard of before? Like you can really go down the rabbit hole thinking about that, can't you? 100%, 100%. 100%, 100%. I mean, this is the thing, you know, we we could have spoke to Jin Drag all night and it could have been right. a three or four hour interview and, you know, I'm sure he'd have more than enough stories just to keep going and going. But, and you yeah. know, we could have discussions, debates, everything else, but obviously it's a podcast. We can't go too long. So, but I thought that the hour that we did have with Jin Drag, he, he gave us a lot and it was For a sure, really yeah, it's great story. Well, everyone, we hope you have an amazing new year. I'm afraid yes. that's all we've got time for today. Today's episode is number 26. So we're officially mm-hmm. been around now for half a year, six months. And I think that's a pretty cool accomplishment. So if you've enjoyed the podcast, please give us a review on Apple reviews or wherever you want to review, that would be great. A five-star review that would really help us with the algorithm. And also if you want to email us, where should they email us, Sam? At mail at the villain pod.com M A I L at the villain pod.com. Yeah. Drop us an email and let us know what you've enjoyed in the last six months and uh, what you want us to keep doing. Maybe what you would like us to stop doing. We're always open for honest critique here on the show. So let yeah, us know. Let us have it. For but sure. I, I hope if you made it this far, then you enjoy the podcast. So, <laughs> yeah. and if you've made it this far and you've got these burning critiques, yeah, let us don't suffer in silence. <laughs> <laughs> let us know. Awesome. All right, Sam. All have right. a great new year. Yeah, same to you, mate. And everybody listening at home, have a good week. Till next week. <laughs>